we can start um, as we are waiting um, other participants to join. Um, my name is Jan Sainz and I'm the uh, Chief of ANCTAD Office for Africa. As you are aware, ANCTAD has released its flagship report on LDCs, and this year report focused on crisis resilient development finance. In this regard, uh, this virtual event was organized to discuss and reflect on the recommendations <coughs> of the report. Uh, specifically, we shall look at the state of crisis resilient development finance in Africa, the challenges and opportunities for financing sustainable development in LDCs, as well as the role and the role of the international community in supporting LDCs in the context of multiple crises. Today, we will have also a panel of experts and they will be sharing their experiences in uh, development uh, financing. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce uh, Junia Davis, um, who is going to give us the opening remarks. He is the head of uh, policy analysis uh, branch at uh, ENCTAD. For the past 20, uh, 20 years, Junior has worked as a professional economist, both in research and consultancy. He holds a doctorate in economics from uh, University of London. In 2008, he joined ENCTAD, um, the Africa and LDC division. He is currently the head of research and policy branch at ENCTAD in the Africa and LDC division, which is responsible for the pro producing the LDC's report uh, we are discussing today. Before joining ENCTAD, uh, Davis served as economic policy advisor at the UK Department for International Development. Davis, um, the floor is yours. Um, for the welcome remarks and the opening of the session. Thank you very much, uh, Diane. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, which focuses on the 2023 edition of the Least Developed Countries Report, entitled Crisis Resilient Development Finance. The least developed countries have been adversely impacted by the fallout of geopolitical tensions and the consequences of a severe external debt, development finance and climate crisis, which is taking a disproportionate toll on these countries. In many ways, this report is about the importance of preserving and expanding the fiscal space of the least developed countries, which has declined precipitously. The report shows that the interlock challenges at both the domestic and international levels constrict fiscal space and block pathways back to a sustainable growth and development path for the least developed countries. This leaves them with few options to pursue a low carbon development tr transition and structural transformation. The report analyzes issues um, uh, such as overseas development assistance, foreign debt, foreign debt, private flows, debt restructuring, climate finance, and financing the investment and spending necessary to reach the sustainable development goals. It also examines if and how central banks in the least developed countries should use climate mitigation and adaptation tools. The report is both timely and topical, as is this discussion, because the international community is debating reform of the international financial architecture, World Bank reform, the Bridgetown Initiative, and within the G20 is discussing international financial flows and possible changes in policy and legislation in the main financial centres where developing country debt is negotiated. UNCTAD is actively participating in many of these processes, either directly or indirectly, since financing for development has been part of the core mandate of this organization since its inception almost 60 years ago. Much of the ongoing discussions have a systemic approach that treats the group of developing countries as a whole. Consequently, <laughs> policy recommendations that are devised for the whole group of developing countries may not be adequate for the particular conditions of the LDCs given the acute structural constraints they face. So this report draws attention to what is specific about the LDCs, which differentiates them from other developing countries in the international financing landscape. 
This refers both to their economic structure and the associated forms of financing for development uh, 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 and their international financial flows. Based on this analysis, the report puts forward proposals and solutions that are, in our view, more appropriate to the particular situation of LDCs. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you in advance for your participation in today's discussion. And I look forward to participating in a healthy exchange of views. Um, to close with some good news, um, the report shows that there exists opportunities to improve the situation and achieve crisis resilient development of the LDCs. But it's urgent that we take action now. Um, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Judy. Thank you so much, Davis, for um, the opening remarks. And it's very important to note that uh, the report mentioned that we still have opportunities uh, to improve the situation. So let us now go into details um, on the report and uh, allow me to invite Rolf Trigger. Uh, he's the chief uh, LDC, uh, country, uh, LDC section at ANCTAD. Uh, Rolf uh, coordinates the research and writings of the Anctad flagship publication, uh, this publication, and he is also in charge of the vulnerability profile series um, on the LDCs um, that are pre-qualified for graduation. He also managed manage projects um, of technical assistance on development policies directed at government and policymaker of uh, developing countries. He has worked at the UN for more than 30 years in ANCTAD and um, in the Economic Commission for Europe. His main topic of work and research are um, sustainable development strategies and policies, uh, LDCs, structured transformation, science and technology, uh, poverty related issues, international trade, environmental development. And based on his research work, he undertakes capacity building and training activities for government officials, researchers, and students in both public and academic institutions. So welcome all for the presentation of the report. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Diane. Thank you for this uh, introduction. And uh, let me start by wishing uh, as my predecessors uh, good morning and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for your participation in this uh, webinar. So I'll uh, share my uh, presentation, which I hope you have. Uh, can you confirm that that's the case? Okay, thank you. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, and of course, we are talking about the LDCs. I think that for this public, uh, they do not need uh, any introduction. As you can see, I would just like to remind you that the vast majority of LDCs are in Africa. It's 33 out of uh, the 46 present day LDCs are in Africa. And so I'll... Um, uh, structure my remarks uh, according to three main points. The first one uh, refers to LDC financing needs. The second one refers to the shortcomings uh, with the, of the international financial system towards LDCs. And finally, what uh, my colleague Juno Davis mentioned, the reforms which uh, the um, report proposes to break the deadlock uh, which, uh, under which uh, the LDCs find themselves uh, at present. So starting with uh, the first topic, i.e. LDC financing needs. So the fact is that uh, the financing needs of uh, LDCs are enormous. And they stem, they stem uh, first of all, from the uh, early stages of economic development and from uh, the uh, very, very strong and stringent needs uh, to undertake a structural uh, transformation of uh, the economy. 
And so uh, in relation to this, Ankbet has performed uh, um, an estimate of what would it take uh, to accomplish or to reach uh, SDG target 9.2, which is that of doubling the share of industry in GDP in the LDCs. And according to our estimates, this would require an annual investment of over $1 trillion. And just to give you an idea of what this means, it means that uh, it would require an annual spending, which is more than three times as much as annual fixed investment of uh, LDCs, i.e. annual uh, gross fixed capital formation of these countries. Alternatively, if you look at it from the perspective of the growth rate that would bring about this uh, structural uh, transformation, it would require an annual growth rate during the 2020s of 20% a year, which of course is absolutely non-realistic. Or another um, estimate that Antat has performed uh, shows that in order for LDCs to reach the social objectives of the SDGs, uh, would require uh, a spending to the amount of 45% of their GDP, which again is enormous. So this is just to provide you an idea of the financing needs. And the point is that these needs were already, let's say, structurally very high as a function of the starting point, starting conditions of the LDCs. But uh, these financing needs, uh, they have been uh, enlarged uh, because uh, of the um, fact that LDCs have been hit by multiple crises. And these are the so-called uh, multi-crises uh, through which the world is undergoing, uh, like COVID-19, the slowdown of the world economy uh, ever since uh, the, uh, the pandemic, uh, rising global inflation, which may be coming down right now, but the effects are there, the very negative effects uh, like high interest rates, etc. The rise of geopolitical tensions and wars, which are setting the whole world, and finally the acceleration of climate crisis. Let's not forget that the climate issues poses an additional challenge for, uh, to the needs of financing of structural transformation of LDCs, which now has to take into account all of the environmental constraints. And given the conditions of LDCs, the bulk of these additional financing requirements need to be covered by external sources. And coming back to the issue of uh, environmental uh, issues, we have seen that among the 20 countries which have been classified as most vulnerable to the negative effects of climate change, but at the same time, the risk at least resilient to climate shocks, 17 of them are LDCs. So this shows that climate financing is absolutely critical for LDCs. And what are some of the consequences of these multiple crises? First of all, you have uh, slower growth, and we have done uh, some simple uh, projections which show that at present, uh, the GDP per capita of LDCs is 16% lower than what it would have been if the LDCs had attained their 7% annual growth target since uh, 2020 and they find themselves uh, within the, that trap. And just in the year of 2021 alone, the debt service uh, uh, soared by 37% to reach $27 billion. But also the, the ratio of their public and publicly guaranteed debt to GDP, it rose from 48% in 2019, though, so just before the pandemic, to 55.4% in 2022, which may not uh, sound like a huge difference, but suffice it so, to say that it's the highest debt to GDP, uh, PPG debt to GDP ratio since 2005, so in almost 20 years. And at present, almost half of the LDCs are either in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. Moreover, 
uh, they uh, LDCs have arrived uh, at a situation in which they spent double, double the amount on uh, that service that they spent on health. And this is just an example of how much their fiscal pay space uh, is shrinking. It's shrinking basically because uh, of the negative effects of these multiple crises, uh, of the um, that trap in which they find uh, themselves uh, at a time when the requests for um, public spending are going up. So uh, the consequence of this uh, is that uh, the squeeze of fiscal space and the debt trap, they risk derailing SDGs progress towards the sustainable development goals and towards the transition to a low carbon economy uh, in what Antpad has called the green structural uh, transformation. So, I mean, already uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, there had been major setbacks in their development process. But I mean, right now, what we see is that there has not been a recovery to pre-pandemic growth and development levels. And this uh, risks uh, continue into the future unless the financing issues are not solved somehow. Come now to my second point, uh, which uh, is the analysis of the shortcomings of the international financing financial system or the international financial architecture towards LDCs in terms of meeting the development finance and climate financing requirements of the LDCs. So the, the first um, uh, conclusion that we arrived to is that uh, the present international financial architecture is not fit for purpose of providing the LDCs with the finance that they need. They need, again, in terms of both development finance and climate finance. So just take the example of the public funds, i.e. ODA, Official Development Assistance. We know that donor countries do not fulfill uh, their uh, commitments. They are uh, collectively at approximately just half the level of committed ODA to LDCs, which means uh, it's, a, it's a huge amount which is not there. And uh, in uh, recent years, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, there has uh, been a drift away from loans, uh, uh, sorry, away from grants towards loans, which has as a mechanical consequence uh, contributing even further to, to higher um, external debt. And as we all know, the shortcomings of uh, ODA, like the fact that it's uh, subject to economic and uh, political cond uh, conditionalities, it's subject to very high transaction costs, but also tra administrative costs, and uh, it's inefficient because of its fragmentation, lack of coordination, lack of alignment, etc. So all of these uh, have been traditional challenges of official development assistance but which continue to be there. And uh, in this context of uh, insufficient and inefficient fun, uh, financing by official development assistance, LDCs have been more and more turning towards private sources of uh, finance. And what's the problem with this? The problem is that uh, the type of uh, uh, finance that they get from private sources, it's uh, too expensive uh, and it's, it's too short term. Whereas what LDCs really need is development finance, which is long term and low cost. So what you need, what you end up with is a mismatch in maturities between the basically short term uh, public finance, uh, private financing, and then long term uh, requirement needs of development finance of uh, LDCs. And you have another systemic issues, uh, which is the fact that, as uh, Juno Davis mentioned in his welcome remarks, 
There are all sorts of initiatives and discussions going on in different forums on the reform of the international financial architecture. And what we see is that LDCs, uh, they try the best they can to air and to voice their concerns and their needs in terms of reform of the international financial architecture. And so the, the, their voice is... Uh, heard, but it's not heeded, because when it comes to taking decisions, uh, like the G20 took, etc., a couple of decisions which were taken and enacted, insufficient as uh, though they were, but the fair matter of the fact is that the voice of LDCs was not heeded at the moment of decision taking. So this is a structural and systemic issue which needs to be addressed. In terms of uh, climate finance, what uh, you have seen is that ever since uh, the signing of UNF uh, C back in 1992, you have had uh, a multiplicity of uh, climate finance for funds, institutions, mechanisms, which have been set up. And this is a trend which has been accelerated over the last uh, 10 years. And uh, what we see is that uh, climate finance suffers from many of the challenges that, uh, let's say, traditional official development uh, assistance uh, suffers, i.e. their fragmentation, the fact that you have this uh, huge number of funds, uh, each one uh, with their own rules of procedures, with their administrative requirements, their reporting requirements, in some cases even conditionalities, etc. So even if they do bring more resources, uh, uh, in terms of development finance to LDCs, uh, access to these funds remains a challenge to the limited uh, uh, administrative and the institutional uh, capacities of LDCs. And then I come to my third uh, and final set of remarks, which is the set of reform proposals that the uh, LDC report 2023 puts forward to break the deadlock of development finance, but also climate finance in LDCs. So in terms uh, of, uh, of the general approach, uh, we formulate the three principles of development financing and climate finance for uh, LDCs, uh, which we call the AAA. And what are these AAA? The first one of them is the amount, i.e. it refers to the quantity. It means that in the future, development finance, but also climate finance, needs to be made available to the LDCs in the quantities in which they need, i.e. it needs to match the financing needs of LDCs, which I mentioned at the beginning of uh, my remarks are really huge, huge. So we are talking uh, about a completely different level in terms of amounts of development uh, finance, which needs to be made available to LDCs. Second, uh, this finance needs to be appropriate. And this refers to the quality of the finance which is made available to LDCs. So this uh, means that uh, particularly in uh, what refers uh, to ODA, it needs to consist basically of grants and uh, the fact that uh, the loans, so when they are loans, they need to be low cost and long term. And uh, in terms of access, uh, this is the third A, so amount, appropriate, uh, appropriateness and access, it means that the international financial system needs to adopt reforms uh, which take into account the specific needs of LDCs, uh, which, uh, let's not forget, are different uh, from the uh, needs and requirements and characteristics of uh, development finance uh, from, uh, uh, from middle-income countries, countries like Indo Indonesia, Kenya, Argentina, etc. 
those of LDCs are different and this has to be taken into account in the discussions of reform of the international financial architecture. So what does uh, this uh, concretely mean? First of all, it's the need that the financing which needs to be made available has to be long-term. Structural transformation, transition towards a low carbon economy, green structural transformation are long-term processes. So therefore the development uh, finance and climate finance which needs to be made available to LDC need to be long-term. And this has been a glaring failure of the international uh, financial architecture to make low-cost and long-term financing available to these countries. And therefore, it's exactly for these reasons and for the needs of LDCs that uh, the main source of uh, finance for these countries needs to be from public sources this is already the case, that needs uh, to be even more the case uh, in the future. So first of all, in terms of ODA, the donors, uh, donor countries need to, uh, to fulfill uh, their commitments. And uh, we have uh, calculated what the actual uh, ODA was back in uh, 2022. It was uh, $70 billion. And if the targets, uh, the LDC specific ODA targets had been heeded, it would have been from anything between $102 billion to $130 billion. So it would uh, basically have doubled the amount uh, of uh, all or almost doubled the amount of ODA um, available to LDC. So this is a major development finance shortcoming. And uh, another uh, source for public uh, development finance to LDCs is the multilateral development banks. There has been a lot of discussion on the role of MDBs uh, and uh, how, ma how much uh, they could raise the development finance to developing countries. And uh, it's been seen that they ha do have the capacity to raise enormous amount of uh, funding in uh, international capital markets and then uh, recycle these funds as again low cost and uh, long term development finance particularly to ldcs in terms of the management of external debt uh, there's a need that the uh, contracts which uh, are concluded between LDCs, LDC agents, and uh, international lenders become more transparent. And also there is a systemic issue, which is the need to establish uh, an uh, internationally agreed and multilaterally agreed debt workout mechanism. This is a long-standing uh, request uh, of uh, developing countries, including LDCs. And now is more than ever the time to uh, advance uh, in terms of its implementation. And there are ongoing discussions in this sense. And uh, uh, also within the context of these uh, systemic uh, discussions, it's important that the voice of LDCs be heard and heeded at the moment uh, of taking decisions. This means that when decisions are taken on these systemic issues, on debt workout mechanisms, on debt suspension, et cetera, et cetera, the LDCs need to be at the negotiating table, which has not been the case so far. In terms of uh, climate finance, uh, there are some principles which need to be put in place. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, very important that it is additional with respect to traditional ODA. Because what we have seen is that uh, there has been a blurring of boundaries between traditional ODA and climate finance. And we have seen a lot of relabeling of uh, aid that was already there as climate finance. And as a, a basic principle of climate finance since the beginning of uh, discussions about it is that it should be additional and separate from other types of development finance. 
And in this uh, sense, uh, the report proposes that the international community should adopt uh, LDC-specific targets for uh, climate finance, just like there exist at present uh, LDC-specific targets for traditional uh, ODA. Related to this, we have the Loss and Damage Fund, uh, which uh, has been discussed throughout this year and is about uh, to be adopted in COP28, which starts within one uh, week's uh, time. And this could be a game changer for LDCs, but depending on the details, as always, the devil is in the details. So it's important that LDCs being the most, uh, among the most vulnerable uh, countries to climate change, that they are almost constant, consequently, among the main beneficiaries of this fund, and that uh, the funds uh, of uh, which are made available to this fund, they are sufficient and easily accessible. And finally, the report innovates by uh, considering the role of central banks at this time in terms of domestic uh, financing. Uh, and uh, it uh, has an in-depth analysis of the conditions for the adoption by the LDCs of climate central banking, which would be the use of central bank uh, tools to efficiently channel financial flows towards green structural transformation. Well, we know that the type of financial sector, the type of financial system that most LDCs have is quite different from those uh, of uh, other developing countries, i.e. developing countries which are not LDCs, not to mention those of developed countries. So this needs to be taken into consideration before these countries decide to embark in uh, climate uh, central banking. And it's also very important uh, that not too much burden is uh, put on, uh, on uh, central banks. They have a role to play, but it cannot be an exclusive role to play. And therefore, it's important to have a whole of government approach towards this. And particularly important is that uh, the role which is attributed to central banks in, the, in putting in place uh, this climate central bank is very much connected and coherent with other policies and particularly industrial policy, particularly green industrial policy, which is the one which aims at the green structural transformation, but also fiscal policy and social policies have to be coherent with this uh, climate central banking. So in conclusion, I would uh, start, uh, finish rather by, by saying that uh, if uh, uh, the uh, development finance and climate finance to, our, to LDCs are not put in the right conditions, in the right amounts, and with the right characteristics, which correspond to the needs of development finance and climate finance of LDCs, this will mean that LDCs will simply not be able to reach the sustainable development goals. Let's not forget that we are midway uh, in the time for execution and for uh, succeeding uh, in the SDGs. And if this were the case, this would be a major failure by the international community. Let's not forget what is repeated time and again in the 2030 agenda, which is leave no one behind. And leaving no one behind uh, means also not leaving the LDCs behind. So I thank you very much uh, for your attention and I do look forward to our discussions this morning. Yeah, so th thank you so much, Rob, for the presentation. Um, three key points I noted from uh, this presentation are the three principles of developing financing, uh, which are the quality, uh, quantity, as well as access. So let us um, go now into the panel discussion. Uh, thank you.
thanks so much for um, our panelists who accepted to join uh, this discussion today. Thank you, Johnson, um, Alma, as well as Alan. Uh, let me give the floor to my colleague, my colleague Judith. She's going to introduce the panelists and uh, moderate the panel discussion. Over to you, Judith. Uh, thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Paul for the presentation, which highlights both um, the challenges and solutions to development and climate finance in least developed countries. In a nutshell, we have heard that um, LDC's financing needs are enormous. We've also heard that the multiple global crises, um, climate emergency, growing debt burdens, dependence on commodities, and declining foreign investments into LDCs have strained their finance, which in turn is jeopardizing their progress towards uh, the sustainable development um, goals. And so the report calls for a lasting multilateral solution to the debt crisis in developing countries and for the mobilization of both development and climate finance in LDCs. And this requires three principles, the amount, the right amount, the appropriateness and access to uh, these finances by LDCs. I am sure we have some questions and comments from the floor, and I would like to request you all to hold on to them until um, after the panel session. That will give us an opportunity to comment or address our questions either to the presenter, to the presenter, or to the panelists. I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, our panel, who will be sharing some of their reflections on the report. I'll start with Mr. Bartholomew Ama, who is the Chief of Development Planning in the Macroeconomic and Governance Division at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. He holds a doctorate, a doctorate degree in development economics from the University of Notre Dame. He served as a tenured professor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, prior to joining ECA. He is an expert in debt management, economic development, development planning and international trade. He conceptualized and designed the integrated planning and reporting tool, a development planning software that digitizes the alignment of national development plans with continental and global frameworks, such as the African Union's Agenda 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. He has also spearheaded several ECA reports, including the Africa, Sustainable Development Report, and uh, Special Drawing Rights and Coronavirus Crisis. He has also provided technical advice to the exec Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa on the design of liquidity and sustainability facility, a special purpose vehicle designed to lower the cost of commercial bor borrowing by enhancing the liquidity and demand for sovereign bonds issued by emerging markets. Uh, market economies, but you're welcome to the panel. Um, our next panelist is Mr. Jason Braganza. He is a Kenyan economist with over 10 years experience working on international development in Africa. He has focused his work over the past decade on trade and regional, regional integration, finance for development and tax, illicit financial flows, domestic resource mobilization, poverty and inequality. Jason is the executive director of the African Forum and Network on Debt and Development. He is the co-head and program director, sorry, he was the co-head and program director of tax at the International Lawyers Project, leading legal pro bono tax reform. Prior to that, he served as the deputy executive director and head of research at Tax Justice Network Africa, where he led their research work and advocacy on illicit financial flows and tax justice at the continental and global levels. Jason has previously worked as a senior analyst at Development Initiatives Africa and as economist at the Ministry of the East African Community in Kenya. He holds a master's in development economics from the University of Sussex and an undergrad undergraduate degree in economics from the School of Oriental and African Studies SOAS in London. You're welcome, Jason. Last, but certainly by no means, is Ms. Alec, Alan Asimwe. She is the Chief of Programs at Trademark, Trademark Africa, 
She is an advocate and policy leader with over 20 years experience as a development advisor and practitioner. She is passionate about governance, trade, regional integration, and development issues in Africa, as well as shaping the continent's narrative. She has designed and managed programs for government agencies, the private sector, civil society, and donors across the African region. She holds a master's degree in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School and a master's in international business law from the University of Manchester. Until December 2017, she worked as a consultant attached to the managing executive director at the Africa Exim Bank, supporting the implementation of the Intra-African Trade Initiative. Prior to that, Ms. Asimwe was the country director of Trademark East Africa, Uganda, where she oversaw a large portfolio of more than $100 million that was aimed at improving ease of doing business through regional infrastructure, trade facilitation, business environment and business environment programs. Welcome to the panel, Alan. So I will start with Bart. Um, ECA has done a lot of work on special drawing rights as an option for affordable financing for, develop for the development of African countries. Could you share with us the status of these special drawing rights? How do they work and how African countries can access them? Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, and thanks to the presenter for this uh, uh, comprehensive uh, analysis of LDCs in the context of uh, financing constraints. Um, yeah, first to put your question in perspective, um, the, the this preceding discussion talked about the financing constraints that the LDCs face. Um, now, financing can be uh, sourced from public uh, sources, both domestic and external, uh, private sources, both domestic and external, all through blended sources. Um, the SDRs fit in the category of external financing. Um, SDR, special drawing rights, uh, first, it's important to note, uh, they are not really money, but they allow you to access uh, other currencies. Um, countries uh, have access to SDRs by virtue of their membership of the International Monetary Fund. And um, currently, uh, countries, by virtue of that membership, have SDR. So in terms of access, it's really by virtue of your membership of that uh, organization. Uh, they are what you call a reserve currency. They allow you to build up on your reserves to use these, uh, uh, what I call resources to access currencies in times of need. Now, um, they have been, every so often, there are new allocations of SDRs. Uh, there are currently about $900 billion worth of SDRs in, in the system. And there have been uh, five allocations, including one that was a one-time allocation um, that was for countries that joined the IMF after 1981 and had never received SDRs. Now, the biggest SDR allocation was in August 2021. Um, it was for $650 billion. Now, so the, 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 what's important to note here is that um, not all countries receive exactly the same amount in SDRs. So depending on your quota share of the IMF, and that's also a function of the size of your economy, you have you're allocated a percentage of those SDRs. For LDCs, they account for 2.4% of the quota shares. Um, the, the US accounts for 16.5 thereabouts. So um, African uh, and LDCs in general received 2.4% of this amount. Um, and uh, this came up to about, um, about $10 billion. $10, $10 billion thereabouts. Um, now it's about uh, you know, $15.3 billion. Now the good thing about SDRs is that, you know, you countries don't have to pay them back. 
Um, but when they use the SDRs, they have to pay an interest rate. SDR interest rates um, during the COVID era were around 0.05%. But now with rising interest rates, we have jumped up to about 4%. 4%. Um, and they don't come with any conditionalities. So you have SDRs, you can use it for whatever you want, no conditionalities. Uh, and you can use it for your budgetary shortfall. So in that sense, as a public resource, SDRs are important to help countries that need them to address their financing constraints without the debt burden that's associated with other sources of financing. But the problem is that the, the countries that need SDRs most and utilize them the least, well, let's put it this way, the countries that utilize them the most and use them, um, uh, that need them the most, actually get less. So um, Africa as a, a, as a continent, I think got 5.2%, and like I said, LDC has got only 2.4%. The utilization rate of developed countries, and actually um, developed countries, got about 60%, of the SDRs, they got about 400 billion, and the developing countries got the rest. So, and there, but however, the developed countries use about no more than 10% of these SDRs. Developing countries use over 50% of the SDRs, but they receive less than 10% of these SDRs. So, therein lies a constraint. So, what we have is a situation where the monies that are required at concessional rates for development are not really available at the scale that um, that uh, is necessary. So SDRs take the cost box. Uh, in terms of access, they to be able to allocate new SDRs, right? Um, what is required is that countries uh, have to a total number of countries with about with over 85% of the voting shares have to agree. So like I said, each country has a share, uh, voting share, and the US has 16.5, which means that the US has to agree for any new allocation. And that 650 billion really required a lot of advocacy to get the US on board. But the question is that, we have a lot of SDRs that are, are floating out there in countries that are not using them. So the issue of on-lending, countries that already have them can on-lend them to others. And some of that is happening, but there's not at, at the scale that is required. Additionally, there are multilateral um, regional banks that can hold SDRs. In other words, uh, not everybody can have access to SDRs. Um, so if some of these SDRs were allocated to them, these banks in Asia and Africa, they could then use them for development purposes by combining that with them with private resources. So to answer your question, SDR is an important source of concessional financing. However, they are not available at scale because the financial architecture really is asymmetric in terms of its allocation to, to the developing countries that need them the most, even though they utilize them the most, utilize them the most, they actually get less. Um, and, and so um, it is important that we look at how we can channel unused SDRs in developed countries to the developing needs, the development uh, needs of developing countries. Um, there's also the issue of um, multilateral development banks currently the way the resources that they have that can be accessed at low rates to LDCs are what I call the, the, the what is called the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, which is administered by the IMF, and the uh, um, Resilience and Sustainability uh, Trust, which is also administered by the IMF. But these resources are not enough. They actually there's a shortfall because of a big demand. So the the big the big message here is that cheap relatively cheap public resources is not available at scale and therefore the only recourse now is for countries to 
to, uh, to um, either blend those resources with private capital, which of course comes at a higher cost. But part of the high cost of borrowing from the private sector is the perceived risks in developing countries. In other words, private investors perceive developing countries to be high risk. So when you blend public resources or private resources, it tends to reduce that risk perception. So that element of blending, in other words, when the public resources are matched with the private resources, the, in, in effect, the public sector takes some of that risk and it then makes the private sector more comfortable. And so the, the, the second message I want to say is that uh, while SDRs are important, they are not sufficient, they need to be blended with private resources. And the next point I want to make is that African countries have a lot of green um, endowments, minerals and, uh, and carbon sinks that can be monetized to, to, to mobilize resources. So um, we then need to explore those options, of course, in addition to the issue of uh, domestic resource mobilization. Um, thank you very much, Bart. You have uh, mentioned very many points and thank you for really uh, putting it into context for us and uh, um, explaining how the SDRs are working. You mentioned something important that um, SDRs are important for concession of financing, but they're not available at the scale that they're needed. And this goes back to one of the principles uh, that the report highlights in terms of um, amount. The finance must match the needs of LDCs. And clearly from um, what uh, you have explained, that is not the case. And this is partly because of the international financial architecture. And so let me move now to Jason on that point. There have been multiple calls for rethinking the international financial architecture in order to make it more responsive to the needs of developing countries. Uh, the report as we had said that this uh, international financial architecture is not fit for purpose because it's largely failed to meet the needs of LDCs. In light of this, in the context of this, is there a case to be made for an African financial architecture and if so, what would it look like? I'll give you five minutes for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith, and to the colleagues at UNCTAD for inviting UPRODAT to this uh, very important discussion. Um, I think the way you've posed the question is a very wonderful way to dovetail what Bartholomew has just spoken about. Um, the case could not be stronger for an African financial architecture because of the inability of the continent to access uh, the requisite amounts um, in a way that is appropriate to support um, the continent's transformational agenda. Uh, indeed, the there is a blueprint to establish an Af African financial architecture under the Abuja Treaty, which calls for the establishment of an African monetary fund, an African financial uh, monetary institute, an African central bank, and so on. But one needs to take into account uh, that we already have some of these processes uh, moving. We have, you know, uh, the African Development Bank. We have um, a number of uh, departments or the divisions within the African Union Commission that are working towards uh, the establishment uh, or seeing through the establishment of the African financial architecture, as described in the Abuja Treaty. Um, the importance, though, of having this architecture in place is not just about creating these institutions um, with a view of fulfilling the, the, the calls or the asks in the treaty, but it's also important to ensure that they have the cor correct or the most appropriate um, philosophical and ideological underpinning of what it will take to transform the continent um, in line with Vision 2063 or Agenda 2063, uh, which is the continental blueprint. And I think here, there needs to be a real appreciation that the role of markets and the role of uh, neoliberalized uh, economic development models are not working. Um, we've seen that these models are, are very extractive, um, and we've seen that there are a number of internal contradictions um, in the model. You know, For many years, and, and just to build on one of the points that Bart has just mentioned, um, the endowments of natural minerals and natural resources um, in the 60s and 70s, this was the big thing in economics. You know, use your natural resources, uh, oil, 
um, uh, uh, copper, diamonds, and then put that somewhere else. And the resources, that the financial resources that come from uh, that sector and then use that for development. But we've seen actually many countries have fallen further behind in their development, despite being so wealthy um, in their endowments. So I think it's very important that we get the the, the correct set of, of um, thinking, ideological and models uh, when we're talking about the how the African financial architecture is going to work and how it's going to actually contribute to the development of the of the continent. And you'll note I'm using the word development and not growth, because this is a, another dimension of what the architecture needs to address our fixation with growth is very restrictive. It's very narrow in its definition. And I know the broader UN through the Secretary General has been thinking about um, expanding the, the idea of what uh, growth actually means in terms of GDP. And so again, this is very important for any form of African financial architecture and the institutions that compose um, the architecture to take into account. The third point really is understanding that the the role of private finance has taken a different complexion on the continent whereas it's supposed to be a complement to public finance it has actually taken the role of replacing public finance in a very big way and that is why in rolf's uh, presentation you're noting that many african governments and including the the group of uh, which fall uh, or are, or are categorized as ldcs are actually transferring a huge amount or percentage amount um, of their resources towards servicing um, creditors. And this is because private credit or private finance has overtaken the responsibility of, of public finance. And as a result of that, even when we do talk about um, different forms of uh, blended finance or hybrid capital um, and all these wonderfully um, developed terminologies, Essentially, what we're saying is we want citizens, African citizens, to subsidize private finance because the state acts as a guarantor or as the risk bearer of, of, of private finance. So I think when we're talking about making the case for an African financial architecture, these are the types of dimensions that we would like to uh, propose that are also taken into account in the analysis so that we're not replicating a model of development that has so far seemed to have um, not delivered for um, the people of uh, Africa, the continent of Africa. And we don't also want to create an architecture that in 50 to 60 years time, we will also say, we, we will stand up here saying that um, is not fit for purpose. There is political will. We have seen several African leaders, including uh, those at at the multilateral level speak out about the need to to move forward uh, with the establishment of an African financial architecture, the continental free trade area, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the others. So there is there are opportunities. Um, I think the the final point I will make is that when we're talking about an architecture on the continent, we should talk about an architecture that is about production. It is about creating revenues on the continent. It should not be an architecture that is used to say, well, we have an architecture, let's leverage external finance. Because I think that, again, becomes a very uh, problematic uh, issue where we then reinforce uh, the current cycle of, of uh, dependency of on external finance. And we start making um, the case for why it is important to get external finance um, into the continent. So those are just a few initial thoughts around, you know, why the case for an African financial architecture should continue to be on the agenda, but what would be the elements to ensure that it doesn't replicate the, the mistakes um, of the current uh, set of international architecture uh, discussions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jason. Um, the key takeaway that I'm hearing from you is that we need a set of thinking and ideological models for an African financial architecture so that we do not replicate uh, the models that have uh, so far failed to deliver for the continent. Let me turn to Alan now. Um, Alan, Trademark Africa has established a catalytic fund, I think this was in 2000, uh, 2022, to support the creation of trade infrastructure and increase access to trade finance for SMEs. How do such financing mechanisms fit within the wider discourse 
on development finance for LDCs. Uh, I'll thank give you five minutes as well. <laughs> thank you, Judith, and thanks to Rolf for setting the context and the scene, and to both Jason and Bud. For, for sharing the challenges faced by uh, developing countries and especially LDCs in accessing uh, international uh, development finance and also the terms, the conditions and all. I mean, we've been in development at Trademark. Uh, we've been in this region for 12 years now and we've seen firsthand the shifts in global financing, especially for development work, infrastructure work. The first 10 years of our, of our existence were able to raise $1.2 billion from grant financing. And with this, over 60% of that went into infrastructure development. And when I talk about infrastructure, I'm looking at catalytic infrastructure at border points, at the ports, and along key corridors that allowed countries to trade, especially within Eastern Africa. It was easier then to make a case why this infrastructure was important, and the gaps that there were in the sense that we didn't have a lot of um, uh, the big DFIs like the World Bank, the IM, not the, the World Bank, the AFDB, and others, we are not looking at these small catalytic uh, invest, investments that were needed at borders. For instance, a traditional border post uh, across straddling two countries will take us anywhere between fifteen to thirty million dollars to invest. However, this is not what, say, the World Bank is looking at or some of the bigger DFIs. And so we found, we quickly found a niche in terms of investments that were needed to make trade happen, but which were not often commercially viable. So you wouldn't find private finance being pulled into these investments. And so for me, that was very catalytic. If you look at some of the border crossings we uh, established, for instance, at the border between Uganda and Kenya at Busia, you'll find that it has catalyzed development of the entire community and that it has led to actually poverty reduction because prices have become cheaper, access to commodities is higher, the towns have grown and expanded and all that. Now, what happened is that with the shocks that Rolf talked about, COVID-19, we've seen Ukraine and Russia, we've seen all these uh, challenges. We've seen a dramatic shift in, uh, uh, in, in uh, development finance, especially ODA. We've seen that the interpretation of what ODA should go to in the last three years has dramatically moved towards humanitarian. So the share of ODA that is going towards humanitarian towards crisis response and less towards traditional aid for trade work is high. We've also seen that whoever sits in that office determines what is meant by say, uh, the poverty focus or fund girls and women. We find that uh, so many will want to put it to traditional aid. You remember that aid we had before in, in, in the eighties and the nineties where you're dishing out bags of portion or bags of food. For many now in, in the developing world, they see that fallback as the appropriate response. They do not see the need to implement uh, development infrastructure as critical. And they try to look for the link for that infrastructure to girls, to women, to poverty, uh, to youth. So that's a case we have been trying to make for a while and recognize that it's a challenge. We know that there are new instruments coming out. For instance, the EU has come up with its global gateway that is looking at catalyzing development around 11 key corridors that have been highlighted. But it's no longer going to be simply grant. It's both a blended finance that is looking at uh, put, providing some funding for soft measures along these corridors. So for instance, policy reforms along tra transport corridors like the Northern Corridor, the Central Corridor, but also looking at um, uh, infrastructure reform. So it's not going to be easy to access finance as we did before for development work. But that's not even the only case, not just infrastructure. We are also seeing a huge gap in trade Finance. So, for instance, if you look at what is available in the market in terms of trade finance, if you look at what commercial banks are offering, if you look at what the DFIs are offering, there is a mismatch between that supply and what is demanded by, say, those who are in finance in in, in the horticulture sector and all. And I mean, Rolf made a, 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 a reference to it. People are looking for patient capital. People are looking for long-term capital. People are looking for 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 that investment that is realistic and looks at the demands of today. Right now it's climate financing, but the banks are not offering that. So there's a mismatch. So in 2022, after a long time of thinking through this, we set up Trade Catalyst Africa, and its main role is really to catalyze commercial finance into development work, and especially work which is not really often seen as either very sexy or very commercially viable, and that requires de-risking. So a good example is the one-stop border posts. 
these are very critical for us to develop our region, especially given that even with the, for instance, the African continental free trade area, countries still retain their, their sovereignty, their borders, they still want to have uh, control of policy, border policy. Uh, you know, we saw how quickly with COVID, countries were able to lock up their borders uh, to safeguard their population. So we know that borders are going to remain with us for a while. I mean, we'd all want an ideal EU situation, but I don't see that happening overnight in Africa. So we do know that some of this infrastructure is still needed, but we don't see how we can catalyze funding unless we create our own models that respond to the needs of these uh, that, 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 are, that are required, that the LDCs require. So border markets, uh, road networks that are perhaps not in commercially viable places, but are critical to move goods from one area to another. And so Trade Catalyst Africa has been set up. We have two windows, but I'm now immediately thinking we definitely need to add a third window on climate finance. So the first window is on trade development. And in this case, we are always in forums where people say, oh, we need to build this road, oh, we need to build this border post, but where we haven't had a lot of work going into project prep, feasibility studies, you know, understanding the needs and all that, and even the financing models. So we are doing a lot of that through Trade Catalyst Africa, just preparing the projects and making them commercially viable and de-risking them. And the second is on the trade finance. I've talked about the mismatch. We are understanding business better and we're seeing how we can catalyze uh, uh, business, uh, how we can provide uh, models that actually work for business. And with these models, then we go back to the commercial sector and the, 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 the DFIs and say, look, we believe this model can work for you to actually grow uh, financing in this sector. So I'm talking about the practical realities as uh, the team looks at the international architecture, development work has to continue because our region is facing crises, LDCs are facing huge insurmountable problems jobs, you know, poverty, illness, we have to do something. So we are trying to see practical solutions on the ground. And now let me come into the topic that we are looking at today in terms of climate financing. We, for the last 10 years, we've done a lot of infrastructure work. And one of the things we've tried to do now is adapt our infrastructure work to meet climate needs. Let me give you an example. In Northern Uganda, there is a marketplace that serves thousands of, of, of women traders and others that perennially floods and everything is washed away. Every year, the market is rebuilt in the same location. Every year, it floods, just like the picture you have on your, on, your, on, your, on your report. So we are now working with development partners to say, how can we adapt this market to, meet, to mitigate the risks of climate uh, 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 challenges so the annual perennial flooding and so we are trying to see how we can elevate that market work with the communities to ensure that they are safeguarded and that they have a durable solution to the problem likewise in Rwanda we've been working with the government on Rwanda to construct uh, ports in uh, in, in, in at the border with uh, with the uh, DRC uh, across the, the Lake Kivu lakes but these have faced crises they are faced climate shocks so here we are looking at climate shocks in one sense and then the onslaught of, of, of these shocks on development uh, infrastructure. Overnight in the region of Rubavu, we had a lot of uh, flooding and we had people dying, we had property lost, we had our own court work being destroyed, equipment being destroyed. And so how can we ensure that climate finance addresses these shocks that are coming out of, not the LDC's on doing, but are coming out of uh, uh, climate change that is uh, unpredictable. And so we are trying to see how we can support that. But the third area that we are moving into very quickly is to see how we can support these LDCs to adapt to the demands of the new world order around climate standards. So we've seen the EU come up with uh, climate standards around business, how businesses do their work. And one of the challenges we are facing is on the air to see on, on the air freight of horticulture produce. We are seeing a backlash in Europe from consumers who are preferring to minimize their carbon footprint. So they want to ensure that they are buying goods that are not being airlifted, especially fresh produce, flowers and all. And yet, if you look at a country like Kenya, almost 90% of its produce, fresh produce is airlifted to Europe. And so we are seeing how can we integrate uh, new solutions to allow countries like Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, that export a lot of their horticultural produce through air to migrate to more uh, adaptable solutions like sea freight. And so that's some of the exciting work we are looking at. And we have set up a fund with some of our partners to see how we can support these governments to adapt to the new realities uh, of the business. So in a nutshell, we are doing as we move, 
but we do recognize the, the challenges, especially with the development finance. We trust that as uh, Rolf and others make this call out, and we've had President Ruto especially, is one of the champions for the reform of the international architecture, architecture. We know we must do things right now to get countries ready. And so for us, Trade Catalyst Africa provides that platform and that to, uh, to actually make trade work for within these uh, challenges. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much, Alan. So small catalytic funds, through these small catalytic funds, we are creating our own models to catalyze the financing needs um, of development for LDCs. Thank you so much, Alan. So I would like to open the floor now. Uh, if there are any questions from um, uh, any of the participants, please do raise your hand and uh, we will be able to give you the floor to speak. Would, are there any questions from the floor? I do see one in the chat. Uh, let me just read it out. It is becoming clear that while there is no issue in identifying those who need finance, the challenge is with the way this finance is allocated among those who need it. Remember, most of the LDCs are resource rich. So there is so the real problem is with the allocation and development of these resources. So the question is, how can citizens of an LDC be assured that efforts are being made to monitor the disbursement of finance to those who really need it. Um, Rolf, could I throw this back to you and perhaps to Davis? Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, Judith and uh, to the person who put the question, I think that there are two different issues here. One is the fact that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as was uh, mentioned uh, by Jason and also in the question, there are many LDCs which are resource rich. That's something that we analyzed and emphasized a lot uh, in last year's uh, LDC report, so the LDC report 2022. But the question is how these riches are put to the service of development because the risk here is repeating, in a sense, the mistakes of the past, which are basically the establishment of extractivist economies. These have been going on for decades and decades and have led, in many cases, to even development uh, setbacks. So the fact is that nowadays, yes, there is a new uh, opportunity. There is a new scramble for resources. You can see consuming countries like Africa, North America, China, etc., trying to secure uh, the, uh, their supplies of strategic resources. And in many cases, many LDCs in Africa are rich with them. But the point is that uh, if the same solutions that were used in the past or the same modalities, institutions, etc., continue in place, this will not going to lead to sustainable development. So the point is that to transform these resources into riches, into uh, structural transformation in a sustainable way, into green structural transformation, it means that the relationships between host countries and investors need to change. The rent uh, appropriation and distribution needs to change. Now, none of this is easy. This requires lots of institutional capacity for negotiating contracts, uh, for the management of these rents, of the res resources, etc. So yes, there is a uh, lot of potential there but it will not be automatically translated into the financing that LDCs need to undergo green structural transformation. There's a lot of work to be done both by the LDCs themselves and again by the international community to help LDCs um, through capacity building, institution building, et cetera, in terms of legal uh, contract negotiations, development planning, et cetera, but, but also fiscal management uh, in order to transform these reserves into resources that will finance development of these countries. Thank you. Um, thank you very much Paul, for that. So institutional building, capacity building, uh, with regards to things like contract management, uh, fiscal management, specifically as it relates to um, uh, the issues to do with resources. Junior, I'd like to um, bring you in on this as well. How can citizens of an LDC 
we assure that efforts are being made to monitor the disbursement of finance to those who really need it. Over to you, Junior. Uh, 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 thank you, Judith. But I think I think um, I think uh, I think Rolf um, touched on uh, most of the, the the key issues. I think um, uh, around this, and I think in the discussion that we just had, I think that Jason and Bart and uh, especially uh, Alan, um, I think indirectly touched on things that I think um, would in some ways help with the more effective rechanneling of multilateral resources to uh, tackle the development challenges that uh, developing countries uh, face i think <clears throat> sorry i think i think if we take a step back and we look at the bigger picture and we think in terms of how in a sense um and i think this is really where the report is placing more emphasis is really how can we make the global financial architecture um, fairer and more accessible in terms of providing financial resources to to, to the least developed countries so that they can uh, they grow um, and develop. I think from what I heard this morning, I think there are really three things that really stood out to me. Um, one is that we have to simplify the global climate financial architecture. It needs to be better co uh, coordinated. I think Alan was talking a lot about the need to strengthen the capacity of countries, uh, not just to develop projects, but to 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 access uh, climate funds, um, particularly um, at the private sector level, so as to 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 promote development. Um, um, and in this sense, I think you know more community-based development. Uh, 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 projects also help mitigate to some extent uh, some of these issues around uh, uh, whether the funds are reaching uh, the people uh, are supposed to. I think um, the second thing I would say is that I thought that what Jason said was really interesting about concessional finance for the LBCs. Um, but what he didn't really talk about very much was the need to, back, to fast track, I think, the G20 common framework for debt treatment. And I think that um, um, will be important if we want to deliver debt restructuring and, and resolve debt much more quickly. And I think it's one of the things that we, we try to emphasize a little bit um, uh, uh, in the report. And I'd be interested to hear what uh, Bart thinks about this because he made a very interesting intervention about the potential role that SDRs could play um, in terms of, of channeling um, indirectly resources to uh, African development banks. Now, I happen to think that the multilateral banks like the AFDB uh, have a really, really important, could play a much bigger role here. And <clears throat> There was talk um, uh, just even a few months ago uh, uh, about perhaps groups of donors with their SD bundle being able to uh, uh, channel those directly to multilateral development banks, which already have uh, 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 in such a way that you know these 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 banks don't necessarily uh, 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 create additional risks. Um, but that they they are able to better leverage and deliver multiples more, three to four times more uh, money for development finance within within the continent of uh, Africa. So I'm interested to hear from Bart, um, um, you know, um, uh, whether such a model, you know, could be made to work more effectively um, and, and through, for example, the African Development Bank or Inter Inter Inter, inter American Development Bank. Um, you know, whilst preserving the 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 the, 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 the reserve asset quality, um, but I think the objective really must be that we're trying to achieve a, a fairer uh, uh, and more equitable access to international financial resources for these countries, um, and and I think that is why it's important that we have these kinds of discussions, these kinds of debates, and that is why I think the report. Uh, is trying to look at ways in which we can better uh, uh, 
reform and address issues around the global financial architecture to achieve that um, for the for the LDC. So yeah. I've, I've tried. I think Rolf answered the first question perfectly well. I'm trying to sort of uh, say it, it, it's, it's a bit broader than that. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Um, thank you very much, Julian. Um, we have just about four minutes left uh, for this meeting, but I'd like to uh, beg your indulgence if we could take about another five, ten minutes to try and um, take one additional question that I see in the chat and also to wrap up. So, but I'm going to let you come in on this. If you could use two minutes, please, uh, to, to respond to, to, to Junior's um, uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Junior. Um... Yes, I mean, you, you rightly pointed out that um, the MDBs and, and, uh, and in particular the AFDB is a prescribed holder of SDRs, meaning it is it has the authority to actually hold SDRs. The issue is this is um, one of um, retaining the reserve asset quality of SDRs. So, for example, so you give uh, uh, ADB 20 billion uh, and then now um, with the understanding that ADB can use that then to leverage additional resources for development. The thing is that that 20 billion uh, becomes a sort of uh, capital, it becomes um, a liquid and therefore begins to then violate this so-called reserve asset quality. To put it in plain English, it basically means that, you know, countries that would give these resources would expect that at any point in time they want to have them back so you cannot use it as your capital for business and so that has been the area of contention and that's one area that's been addressed and so when we talk about you know revamping the uh, architecture the financial architecture these are some of the specific things that we need to look at perhaps we need to have a pool of sdrs that are non-member country specific and that are, are not really bound by those strict reserve asset requirements. Because if you have that stock of resources that can be used as capital to leverage additional resources, then you really have a more catalytic effect than to have 650 billion spread across 193 countries. The impact is limited, especially when you take into the fact that most of these countries that hold most of those reserves are sitting on them and not really using them as much. So that, that is, 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 is critical. And just to make a point about the Africa's green assets, I, what, I was not talking about you know, just selling those things um, in its raw form. We have an example in DRC where DRC is using its, its lithium and its those assets to produce battery precursors. So it's really about value addition. Uh, leveraging regional value chains and the, the markets that are being uh, made available to Africa through the AFC FTA. So really it's not the old model, it's more of a new model, but really uh, bringing actors together to add value to those resources. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Bart, for those points that you have raised. And speaking about um, having a pool of members that are non-member countries specific uh, under the SDRs, there's a question in the chat about how the African Union can leverage its G21 membership to the benefit of African countries. I'd like to bring in Jason and Alan on this, if you could each take two minutes before we then wrap up. So we'll go to Alan first. No, thank you so much. I think there's a huge opportunity and we've spoken, we've all spoken about it. The Africa continental free trade area does provide an opportunity for Africa to have one voice on critical issues, uh, on our trade policy, on really harmonizing the way we, we are engaging with all these international uh, platforms to ensure that the money that we get works for Africa, that it actually helps us address where the needs are most. So for instance, looking at where trade is happening most or where trade is likely to grow most. And I know Yuneka has done a lot of these studies and its trade data is, uh, provides this, uh, this information. We would then be able to galvanize resources to those points. And so I think, and we've discussed this with His Excellency, the Secretary General at the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Area, how we can shift from being recipients to actually shaping the narrative of this is where most trade is needed or most interventions are needed. 
So for instance, right now we're working with the, the AFCFTS Secretariat and with the ECOWAS Secretariat to see how we can hone in some of the lessons we've learned in the Eastern African region around Abidjan Lagos. Abidjan Lagos corridor from Abidjan to, to, to Lagos, over 75% of all economic development within that region happens along that corridor, 75%. You can imagine what any shifts around making it more efficient, more green, you know, more catalytic would be to developing the entire region. And so we are having these conversations. We're already trying out some pilots around making the borders more efficient, more seamless, so that more trade can happen. Right now, we only have 5% trade happening along that corridor. And yet you can imagine what a giant like Nigeria and say Ghana would do if they could trade more, if they could have more access, if you could remove the, you know, the, the barriers along those corridors. So I think platforms like the African Continental Free Trade Area, the African Union, do bring that political leverage that is needed, do bring the uniqueness of uh, and, and, and similarity of voice, but also do allow us to say, this is where we must invest. Yes, we need your money, but we want it here. This is where we must uh, invest to catalyze uh, development, to mitigate climate change, to make our communities adapt and all that, yeah. So I hope I've responded to that. Yes, thank you, Alan, indeed. We need the, uh, the, those, uh, the African Union, the AFCFTA, they bring the political leverage and similarity of voice that we need to direct the resources to where it actually works for us as African countries. Jason, uh, two minutes, how can we leverage um, how can the African Union leverage its G21 membership to the benefit of African countries? Thanks, Judith. And yeah, I mean, it's an important question um, in terms of how the membership itself is going to pan out. I, I mean, it's a, it's a full membership, which is which is good. It's not observer, which is a, a, a good step. Um, I think, you know, the, the G21 now um, is richer in terms of uh, representation in uh, of, of, of the continent uh, within that grouping. Um, there are opportunities, particularly, I think, uh, Junior asked about, you know, the, the, the common framework. There are opportunities there to see how to strengthen it. Um, hitherto, you know, we've been outside of, of the framework uh, and, you know, and, and outside of the, as a continent, outside of that grouping. So, Hopefully, there you know the African Union Commission can take uh, full advantage of that. Um, but it's also important to note that you know also being part of this group means that there is a responsibility on looking at the entire architecture and not just um, finance uh, or or debt and and tax and illicit financial flows. The issues that Alain has talked about with with regard to trade and how we take advantage of that and being part of the the G twenty one now uh, takes take shape. I think lastly, it's important uh, just to sort of bring it round to what Bart has just mentioned is um, the value addition aspect of what we're trying to achieve uh, through through our assets and our resources becomes very important. But important, more important than that is we're not necessarily or should not continue to necessarily focus just on export markets. Because when we do that, what we're doing is undermining the domestic capacity of our domestic producers, our domestic consumers. Because what you do is you implement or develop policies that promote export-driven uh, businesses and enterprises to flourish, while at the same time potentially undermining domestic production and domestic com consumption. And so I think it's important to arrive at that balance when we're talking about this, and so that we don't then create also this perpetual cycle then of external exports uh, and then sort of debt financing to then fill in the gap for other bits and pieces that within the economy that need to be um, addressed. So for me, that's how also the role of the G21 now becomes very important for the African Union and the African Union Commission, um, that we make sure that this does not uh, undermine th that type of trajectory. Um, thank you very much, Jason. I will not attempt to summarize everything. Diane will do that in the next session where she will be providing the closing remarks. And this brings us to the end of the panel session. Let me thank all our panelists, Alan, Bart, um, and Jason for joining us and sharing some the very interesting um, insights in terms of uh, crisis resilient development financing and on the work that you're each doing in your respective um, institutions. A big thank you to Rolf and Junior as well as, as, well as to the participants who have contributed um, questions. So I would like to hand the floor back to Diane now for her closing remarks and summary.
Diane is the recently appointed Chief of UNCTAD's Regional Office for Africa. She has extensive work experience in development related areas such as trade and investment promotion, special economic zones, SME support and gender promotion. Before joining UNCTAD, she worked with the Rwanda Development Board and she also served as an advisor in the Office of the Executive Director at the International Trade Center. This was under the Mo Ibrahim Leadership Fellowship Program. She also worked with the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning in Rwanda. Diane is a board member of different institutions in Rwanda, such as the University Teaching Hospitals, the Local Administrative Entities Development Agency, and the Rwanda Standards Board. She has a master's degree in international and development economics from the Economic School of Louvain, Belgium. Diane, over to you for your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end um, of, of um, our event. Uh, let me try to recap some of the key points uh, we discussed uh, over the event. So number one, it's very clear that um, this report or this specific uh, topic is, is coming at the right time uh, where um, there are uh, discussions around reform of international financial um, art, uh, architecture. Uh, and uh, it's also coming in the right time because um, LDCs are facing very critical uh, financial needs. Uh, because of the multiple global crises, the climate uh, emergency, the growing uh, debt burdens, the dependence on commodity, um, the decline in the foreign um, investment. So all those facts uh, are really affecting LDCs, LDCs and it also affects their capacity uh, toward achieving the sustainable development goals. So over the discussions, um, we looked at some uh, some possible opportunities existing and the possible um, ways of overcoming these challenges. So it was clear that um, uh, domestic agencies can also play a key role, particularly central bank, in enhancing the mobilization of national resources um, and steering financial flow toward a green structure uh, transformation in these countries. Uh, it was also mentioned that um, SDI could be um, a source of financing for LDCs. However, uh, it's still uh, very challenging for them to access um, the SDI. Uh, it was also mentioned that um, the, the role of the Africa finance that there is a need of having um, the Africa finance uh, structure, uh, and that structure really has to be um, linked to the existing need in Africa, and that structure has to bring uh, finance and financial means to the African uh, continent. Uh, we also received a practical reality example uh, from uh, trade, um, Trademark Africa, where investment in infrastructure are contributing a lot in the development. And however, um, that's even if the investment in the, in the infrastructure are contributing to uh, the development, uh, the, the donors or the development partners are now shifting the development financing uh, toward humanitarian financing. So um, briefly, uh, that's all the key points I captured um, in these discussions. And um, to conclude, it's very, very important for the global community to urgently address the critical financing challenge, uh, challenges for um, LDCs. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my colleagues, um, I would like to thank you all for participating in this event specifically uh, the speakers for sharing your thoughts and as well as your experience. Um, we hope to stay in touch uh, in, in the coming discussions as well. Um, as we are concluding, I uh, would like to request each one of us to put on our camera so that we can take a group photo. Yes, so. Okay, so thank you so much. Have a very nice day.
Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.